let's start the session with the prayers vasudeva sutam devam kamsa chanura mardhanam devaki paramanandam krishnam vande jagat gurum Today we are going to see the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita titled Purushottama Yoga. Before I enter into the chapter, I would like to go through the 14 chapters briefly. so that you know from where we are coming and where we have to go from here on for the next 10 minutes i will give you a short background of what we have studied so far when we enter the spiritual study the guru tells us that you have to study three texts called as prasthana trayam if you want to study the scriptural literature the guru says you need to study three textbooks the first textbook prescribed is called as bhagavad gita the second is the upanishads and the third is brahma sutra so the student says okay i want to start the study can i study the bhagavad gita first then the guru says to understand bhagavad gita you have to do some preliminary texts which is called as prakarana granthas the two more the two most popular prakarana granthas are atma bodha and tatva bodha so we start with tatva bodha then we do atma bodha tatva bodha is a text which gives us all the terms definitions of all the terms which is used in the bhagavad gita and in the upanishads and in the brahma sutra atma bodha is an introductory text dealing with atma which is the focus of all the three texts so the student learns these two texts and then there are in some schools they take other texts like upadesha sara also but or vivek chudamani the, the depending on the school where you go they take different other texts before they start bhagavad gita upanishads and brahma sutra so we have done in our study group the prakarana granthas upadesha the we have done uh, uh, tatva bodha atma bodha we also studied dridrishya viveka and then we entered into bhagavad gita after this we will be doing the upanishads and later on the brahma sutra when we started the bhagavad gita we said there are 18 chapters the main method taught in the bhagavad gita is twofold one is called as yoga shastra which means how do i lead my life according to the scriptures so this is one topic in the bhagavad gita the second topic which is dealt with is 
called as brahma vidya brahma vidya means in this universe there is something called as brahman brahman means it is a formless entity formless god which is called as brahman and the god with form is what we see as the entire world this is how the scriptures present god so if you want to know god you can know god either by just opening your eyes and seeing the world or you can close your eyes and then see the formless god in your own heart together the form and the formless is called as brahman the form the god is called as ishvara formless is called as brahman so in the bhagavad gita at the end of every chapter it is said this chapter is titled so and so and it is dealing with the two topics number 1 yoga shastra and number 2 brahma vidya so a student inquires into three areas who am i the jiva what is this world i see before me the jagat and who is this creator of this whole universe ishvara or brahman so with this the study of the bhagavad gita starts bhagavad gita is a text it's called as a divine song and it is presented in a form of a story between a guru and a shishya the guru is lord krishna and the shishya is arjuna the scenario is a battlefield in the battlefield in two and a half hours this entire dialogue happened between the guru and the shishya before the war starts and then at the end of two and a half hours the war starts that's it so in between before the war starts uh, uh, this dialogue happens for about two and a half hours and then the war starts and arjuna wins the battle and he gets gains the kingdom that is what the background story is 18 chapters the first chapter i will give you a, just a rundown of the 18 uh, 14 chapters so that you know where we have where we are now the first chapter is called as arjuna vishada yoga it deals with the sorrow which arjuna faces in the battlefield the main sorrow is to experience the death of thousands of warriors including his guru and grandfather this is the sorrow which arjuna faced in the battlefield and he broke down he said why should i fight this war where i have to kill my own guru and kill my own grandfather because they are standing in the opposition for, uh, in the opposite field because they are attached to the adharma side arjuna is fighting a dharmic war a just war and it so happened that his own guru was in the opposite side and when he had to when he had to imagine a scenario where he had to fight with his own guru and grandfather he broke down and he told lord krishna that my heart is full of sorrow 
I am totally confused. I become your student. Can you guide me? First chapter. The second chapter is called as Sannyasa Yoga. It is, it is called as Sankhya Yoga. And this Sankhya Yoga, Sankhya means knowledge. So Lord Krishna, right in the beginning, he gives the full thrust of the main topic which he wants to teach in the 18 chapters. In the second chapter, he says, from verse number 12 to verse 30, he says that you are not aware neither about yourself, neither about others. But you say you are a Pandita. You think that you are a Pandita. You think you are clever. You think you are a knowledgeable person. And he says, what you don't know is your real nature. And your real nature is you do not die. Neither you die, neither any one dies. Because you have a higher nature which you are ignorant about. And that nature is called as Atma Vidya, which is Brahma Vidya. So you don't know that you are Atma. You think you are the body. You think you are going to be killed because the body will die, but not Atma. And then in a series of verses from 12 to 30 in the second chapter, the full gist of Brahma Vidya is given. The second chapter is also known as an introduction to the whole Gita. It gives us all the topics which will be discussed. It discusses Karma Yoga. It discusses Sthita Pragna Lakshana, that means a person who has learned this Atma Vidya, how will he live in the world? So these are the three main topics, Brahma Vidya, Karma Yoga, and uh, Sthita Pragna Lakshana, three topics in the second chapter. The third chapter is called as Karma Yoga. Now, after having given the full gist in the second chapter, from third chapter till the sixth chapter, Lord Krishna prepares Arjuna, Arjuna's mind. That is the goal in three chapters, chapter three, four, five, six, four chapters. So the third chapter is called as Karma Yoga. There he says that you need to do uh, action in life. Nobody can live without any action in life. You cannot say that I will go to the mountains and lead a sannyasa life because the prakriti will not allow you to go. Your nature will force you to act. Whether you are in the Himalayas or whether you are in the battlefield, you will have to act. So you cannot say I will run and then I'll be very peaceful. So the secret of karma yoga was taught in the third chapter, which is twofold. One is called as Ishwara Arpana Buddhi, which means I do all actions in life with a view to know, to realize God. That's all. Therefore, what you say is all the actions which I do, all the actions means the duty towards the family, duty towards myself, Every All my actions, I say, okay, oh Lord, I'm doing it for you. Now, why? Because I want to please you. And why do I want to please you? Because I know you'll take care of me. So you have total surrender to the Lord and say, that is called as Ishwara Arpana Buddhi. One part of Karma Yoga. The second part of Karma Yoga is called as Prasada Buddhi. Prasada Buddhi means Whatever result of action which I get, I will take it as a prasad. Good or bad or indifferent, I will just take it as a prasad. I will accept it. The main thing is acceptance. 
So with this karma yoga lifestyle, one can try to get samatvam in life. Samatvam means a balanced, equipoise mind. Which is ultimately required for the Brahma Vidya. Then in chapter 4, Jnana Karma Sanyasa Yoga, Lord Krishna teaches Arjuna that, that through Jnana, you can come out of identification that you are doing a karma. Through Jnana. Atma Jnana. Your actions at the body level will continue, but in your mind you can say, I am not the karta, not the doer of actions, but I am a witness of the body doing actions. So he elaborately discusses how this is possible in the fourth chapter. In the fifth chapter, called as Karma Sanyasa Yoga, he talks about another lifestyle where one can renounce the action which is not required in life. That means you take sannyasa and then you study the scriptures, which is called as physical renunciation. The fourth chapter deals with mental renunciation and the fifth chapter deals with physical renunciation. These are all meant for what? For purification of the mind. So that when the Guru teaches that this is what is your nature, your mind is ready to, to, to understand with full clarity. The sixth chapter is called as Dhyana Yoga. In Dhyana Yoga, simple technique of meditation is discussed. For those of you who want to learn meditation, this is the best chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. You can go through my notes, my videos are available in the, uh, in the, uh, in the YouTube and also if you require them, I have already sent it to all of you. In case you still need it, I can send you, uh, I've taken I think roughly about 150 talks so far. I can send you a link where you can see all these 150 talks. If you write to me, I can send you the link. And that is, will be, you can see it in your laptop or you can see it in your uh, mobile phones. Whichever chapter, whichever talk you want to listen, you can just listen without any problems of advertisements in the YouTube. So the sixth chapter is full of Dhyana, lo, dhyana Yoga. Why is meditation important? Because when we have a mind which is very, very agitated, and a disturbed mind cannot receive knowledge. In order to receive knowledge, you need to have a quiet mind. So the practice of meditation is prescribed. The full process of meditation is also discussed. And we see that in the sixth chapter. The seventh chapter, so the first six chapters are called as the first shatkam, which is basically describing or the, the jiva, who am I? That aspect is being discussed in the first six chapters. The next sex section is called as Ishwara section. It's called as Tatpada. And what we learn is from the chapter 7 to chapter 12, we learn about God, the nature of God. The seventh chapter is called as Jnana Vijnana Yoga. 
Jnanam means the knowledge, general knowledge about the world. Vijnanam means special knowledge. Viseshena Jnanam. That special knowledge is about the formless nature of the Lord. In that chapter, it is called as Paravidya Aparavidya. These are just technical terms. Eight chapter deals with death. What happens during death? And how should you face death? It's called as Akshara Brahma Yoga. Lord Krishna says, at the time of death, one should chant Om. Chant Om continuously till your body leaves this world. When you do that, what happens is you attain oneness with the Lord. Very beautiful chapter. There are certain verses there, very prominent ones. So it discusses how I can become one with the Lord when I leave this world. It's called as Akshara Brahma Yoga. Akshara means imperishable. The Lord which is taught in the Bhagavad Gita is not the Lord with the form, in Krishna form, but Lord teaches Arjuna the formless nature of Lord Krishna, which is called as Brahman. So that is in the seventh chapter titled Jnana Vijnana Yoga and 8th chapter Akshara Brahma Yoga. The ninth chapter is a continuation of the 7th chapter to give a little bit more details about the Lord and it's titled uh, Raja Vidya Raja Gokhya Yoga. So in Raja Vidya means it is that it is it is uh, it is kingly knowledge. This knowledge about the Lord is a very secret, it's a highly secretive knowledge because only when your mind is ready, you will be able to understand the real nature, the formless nature of God. So it teaches us how I can know the Lord in a little bit more detail. Then a very interesting chapter, the 10th chapter is called as Vibhuti Yoga. Vibhuti Yoga is the glory of Ishvara. In what all forms I can meditate on the Lord, the Lord describes in the 10th chapter, Vibhuti. He takes different examples right from Himalayas to uh, the Ganga River to so many examples he gives. So in every form, wherever you see excellence in this universe, suppose you see any brilliancy in this universe, on in any person, in any object, if you see some glory, immediately remember this is the glory of the Lord and that is formless in nature. What I see is the formed Lord, but what I have to know is the higher reality of the Lord. That is the 10th chapter, a very beautiful chapter. Then the 11th chapter is called as Vishwaropa Darshana Yoga. Vishwarupa Darshana Yoga explains to me how can I see this entire universe in one form of Lord Krishna. In the 10th chapter, the Lord said, you see one in many. That means one God in the entire universe in many forms. That is the 10th chapter. The 11th chapter is 
There are many forms. How do I see it in one? This is the process called as, there is a methodology which is involved here. It's a technical process. It's called as Adhyaropa Apavada. Manifestation and manifestation. This is a technique used in the Bhagavad Gita to tune your mind so that you can know your real nature. So these two chapters help you to expand the mind and contract the mind. Expand the mind and contract the mind. When you learn this technique from these two chapters, what happens to you internally is, whenever the mind is projecting something in your mind, you start noticing it immediately. Suppose the mind is thinking about your son in the US. Immediately you, you become aware, oh, my mind is thinking about this. Suppose this is not something which you want, immediately you want to bring it down and drop it and then go to something else. Then you contract the mind, the projection drops. And then you remain focused in whatever you are doing at that moment. This is the technique followed in the Bhagavad Gita so that you become aware of your mind. Whenever the mind projects, become aware. Whenever the mind drops everything, like you drop everything in sleep, and then you go into unmanifest form. That means your mind contracts. Where? In the Chit Akasha. The mind contracts in the awareness principle, in the consciousness principle, in the space of consciousness. So this is a technique so that you can realize that you are of the nature of awareness. So the 10th and the 11th chapter are beautiful chapters to train the mind. The 12th chapter is called as Bhakti Yoga. And Bhakti Yoga is, everybody knows, is devotion. Devotion to one principle called as God, or you can call it the higher nature, whatever it is. There is one principle in life, which is called as universal life which is reflected in all our hearts. Without that life principle, we cannot act in the world. We cannot know anything in the world. So how to tune my mind towards that universal principle is taught in Bhakti Yoga. So that finishes the second section of the Bhagavad Gita which is the second shatkam, second major section. The third section begins with chapter 13. Chapter 13 is a very beautiful chapter. From this section, the real study of who am I starts. If you want to know who you are, you, the, where we left in the second chapter, the, the verse number 12 to 30, the same thing is expanded now. And Lord Krishna is explaining to us that we have two natures. One nature which I'm aware of, the body. I'm aware of this body. To some extent, I am aware of my mind. This is one nature of mind, one something which I know. The second nature, this is called as a lower nature. Ahamkara, I, ego, I, the nature of the ego. Then the second aspect, which I don't know, which I have to learn from the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads or the Brahma Sutra, that is called as Sakshi Bhava. 
Sakshi means there is a consciousness in this body. That consciousness is the universal life. It is the electricity behind the bulbs which you say, suppose you take a bulb which is glowing, there is the bulb glows because of electricity. This bulb of the body and the mind glows because of consciousness. Without consciousness or the awareness, this body or mind cannot be active. How do I realize this consciousness? Very easy. In the waking state, my body is active. Consciousness is there, plus the body being active is there. I am aware of the body, active. I am not aware of the consciousness. Same thing happens in dream also. The mind is active. Consciousness is there, which is illumining the dream state. There is no other light in the dream except the light from the consciousness. There is no light in the waking except the light in, from the consciousness which illumines even the sun in the waking state. But I am not aware in the waking, I am not aware in the dream. In the sleep state what happens? I am ignorant about the body and mind. So the same light which is consciousness is illumining ignorance. What happens is, I now go through the three states in my mind in the waking state. I try to understand what, who am I? Am I the one who is the waker? Am I the one who is the dreamer? Am I the one who is the sleeper? The Upanishads tell us that you are none of the three states, waker, dreamer, sleeper, but you are the consciousness. When I hear this from the Guru, I can easily understand and take my mind towards that pure principle, which is the underlying principle of all my activities. This is what is presented in the 13th chapter called as, this awareness is termed or titled Shetraknya. Shetraknya means knower of the field. And Shetra means body. That means this body is like a field of experience. The knower of this field is called as the Shetraknya. I am the knower of the field. I am not the body or mind which is known. The same thing is presented another by another two terms called as Purusha and Prakriti. And the same thing is also known by another two terms called as Jnanam and Nyaya. So what did I learn from the 13th chapter? I am the awareness, consciousness principle. I am not the body or mind. This is the height of wisdom, spiritual wisdom. The same concept of the Shetraknya or the Purusha is explained in the 14th chapter in another fashion. The 14th chapter deals with gunas. Gunatraya Vibhaga Yogaha. That is what we did before now, in the last one, two months, we did that 14th chapter. The 14th chapter is very beautiful chapter, which I have explained in verse by verse form, to understand that there are gunas. Guna means there is a nature of prakriti. It's a nature of five elements. Sat, sattva, Rajas and Tamas. 
these three terms were introduced in the 14th chapter to say what how does nature affect my performance in life the most important factor we must remember of the 14th chapter is my mind is made up of the subtle body which is the subtle five elements this i was taught right in the beginning in tattva bodha but now i am trying to understand what i learned in my kindergarten tattva bodha i am trying to understand at the graduate level which is this bhagavad gita so the mind is made up of three climates i am satvik in the morning sattva means peaceful rajasik in the afternoon rajasik means i am very very dynamic i want to do tremendous action i want to achieve things in life and then the third mode of the mind is called as tamasik tamasik means i am very lazy i want to sleep so this mo three modes or three climates of the mind every day i have to face who am i in the body i am the indweller consciousness principle which is aware of this mind consciously i try to create a distance between me the consciousness awareing principle and the mind so if you understand the 14th chapter well you would have created that distance this distance is very important when you want to realize god in yourself in your own heart you want to realize that nature of the god which is called as the higher nature of the god the formless nature of the god you may ask a question how can i realize what is formless here the upanishads have got a technique the technique is called as neti neti they say yes you are right you will not be able to know your formless nature you are very right you are a very clever student but the upanishad says can you from your mind drop all the forms which you can think about or see perception and conception you try to drop perception means all the five sense organs which are seeing the forms colors sound taste touch tell yourself i am none of those that is the first exercise i drop the five sense organs related to the five sense objects in the universe then i come into the internal mind mind is basically an instrument in this body which is projecting thoughts after thoughts after thoughts there is mind means thoughts without the vritti there is no mind so basically i am projecting concepts imaginations memories from my own mind i project i see memories i bring it to the to the conscious level and i see those memories when i see the memories i start projecting you know i will be like this i'll be like that in future i am worried about my children all that are all projections conceptions of the mind so in the 14th chapter the lord teaches us that there is a state by which you can drop the projections and conceptions and be with your real nature which is called as awareness when you drop all the forms and the conceptions 
by neti neti not this not this what you arrive ultimately whatever you whatever it is that is your real nature when you arrive at that real nature understand you are one with god the highest source from where the entire universe is coming what we have learned in the 11th chapter and the 10th chapter there is only one source for the whole universe which is the material cause and the intelligent cause of the universe that source you reach in your own heart by learning to understand your mind which is made up of three gunas understand to drop these three gunas and remain or abide in guna atita atma so the technique is only dropping because that atma which is there in you is self evident consciousness pure awareness is what we are all experiencing in our sleep state without the ignorance that i am the one who is sleeping you learn to drop that ego the sleeper i in the waking state you cannot go to sleep state and say oh i'm going to drop it i'm going to realize in the sleep state it's not possible in the waking state you say i am that pure self i am that pure consciousness which is realizable in the waking state as the pure sakshi pure witness principle i am that pure bliss in that there is no sorrow it's only peace because it is of the nature of peace then the guru says that is your real nature whatever you experience in life in the waking dream and sleep all that is your incidental nature it comes and goes waking will come dream will come sleep will come that is an incidental thing it will keep on coming and going but you wanted to know who you are you are the guna atita atma where the nature of five elements does not affect you it is the purusha principle the consciousness principle the kshetrajna principle which is higher in nature that is the independent principle it can exist on its own this waking dream and sleep cannot exist on its own it is dependent on the substratum of that pure consciousness once the guru teaches us that that is my real nature then i just had to remember that nature of mine throughout my life and then lead the life let the life go on let the life bring anything or let the life bring sorrow joy whatever it is but my mind gets the strength to face the life this comes from the 14th chapter of the bhagavad gita this was a short summary in about 45 minutes the entire objective of spiritual study to drop sorrow in life and to be happy you follow the three texts bhagavad gita upanishads and brahma sutra what you achieve from that is that you are of the nature of pure awareness consciousness with this background let us now enter into the 15th chapter purushottam yoga if you reverse this title it is called as uttama purusha the second part of purushottam you reverse it uttama purusha yoga uttama purusha means the highest purusha 
which generally we say is Lord Vishnu. So this, this chapter is basically dealing with Lord Vishnu in our own heart. How to see that Lord Vishnu is the subject matter of this chapter. This chapter is a very short chapter, 20 verses. Generally, this chapter is, is, uh, is chanted. If you attend uh, one of the Vedic schools of uh, Chinmaya Mission, or if you go to Arsha Vidya school, this chapter is, is chanted every time before lunch or dinner. Before you take your food, you chant the whole 20 verses. Because you remember the Lord, in one of the verses, the Lord says, I am the digestive fire. Aham vaishvanaro bhutva praninam dehamashritaha pranapana samayuktaha pachanam satuvida. He says this, the Lord says that I am the digestive fire in this body. Remember that before you take the food. By doing that, we are converting the food into a ahuti, an oblation in the fire existing in your stomach. You are conducting a yaga. The food taking becomes like a prayer, like a yaga, homa kunda yaga where you instead of throwing, even instead of offering the oblations into the fire outside, you are mentally offering the food which you take to the Lord who is, preside, who is presiding inside you as the jatar agni, jatar agni, the digestive fire. Without the digestive fire, there is no digestion, Without digestion, your body cannot survive. Therefore, what, what does it mean? The Lord, even though I can know it in the form of an idol in a temple, I can remember that Lord is present in this body in the, in the, in the form of fire principle. This is one of the examples given. So the 20 verses are fairly easy to learn. Like the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is easy to learn. Children are generally taught, I, generally they start with 12th and then they say you learn the 15th because both of them have got 20 verses. You can finish chanting of these verses in about 8 to 10 minutes. So you want to learn Bhagavad Gita by heart, you learn, start with the 15th chapter, easiest chapter. And also it is useful because you can remember, when you know something by heart, you can remember for meditation purposes. So the 20 verses of the 15th chapter are divided into these class broad groups. I put them just to get you, give you a just a bird's eye view of what we will be studying in this 15th chapter. So the first two verses, see the 15th chapter is teaching us about the higher nature of the Lord and the higher nature of the Jiva. When I say higher nature, it is only, it only means in actually speaking, when you try to realize what the Bhagavad Gita is trying to reveal, if you want to realize, it becomes fairly easy. Through words, it, became, it may sound very, very big and all that, but when you try to apply it in your own mind, it becomes very easy. I am the consciousness principle. I am the awareness principle. That is my higher nature. It can exist by itself. Without the body, mind, it can exist by itself. Therefore, it is called as eternal. That means I don't, I, I am not born. I am not, I do not die. If I know I am that consciousness awareness. If I know how to segregate my body, mind from this awareness, and claim this awareness as my own nature, 
the job of entire spiritual study is finished. I just live it, live my whole life as a consciousness awareness. Even if you don't understand, if you know, if you don't understand other portions, if you just understand, I am of the nature of awareness and keep repeating this in your mind, one day you will surely claim with perfection, with 100% conviction that I am this awareness. What I was taught in the Bhagavad Gita, I have now realized it as my real nature. When that happens, the bliss which you get, the knowledge which you get at that, at that moment will, according to the Shastras, it says, it will drop all your future janmas. You will not have any birth of the body. It, you will get rid of all the sorrows of life at one go. So first two verses are describing what is the samsara problem. How is the samsara? They compare the samsara with the tree, tree example. I will, when we go through these verses, you will come to know more details of it. So in the first two verses is samsara varnanam. Then the, from verses three to six is how do I make my mind strong to learn about this Atma, about this pure consciousness? It gives me four disciplines, Vairagyam, Satguna, Sharanagati, and Atma Vichara. We will, we will learn more about this when we do the verses, but here just know that I'm going to learn how to make my mind strong. Then from verse 7 to 15, it gives me full details of how I can experience this nature of consciousness. It is not a substance, but it is the ultimate reality. It is not, it is not a product, but it is the cause of everything in the universe. So the whole process of how to realize this pure consciousness, awareness, is taught from 7 to 15. Then, verses 16 to 18 is the crux of this whole chapter. Where Bhagavan expresses in three, 16, 17, 18, three verses, three beautiful verses, he tells us, in conclusion, how can, you, how can you understand this pure consciousness? It is not the manifest universe, which is perishable, Shara Purusha. It is not Akshara Purusha, which is unmanifest. That means what I experience in the deep sleep state, the unmanifest nature of the universe, it is not that. That is called as unmanifest, Akshara Purusha, because that again comes back next day morning. Again, it perishes, comes back to unmanifest. Again, it comes out. So manifest, unmanifest is called as Shara Purusha, Akshara Purusha. The nature of the Purusha, the nature of that consciousness is Shara Purusha, Akshara Purusha. What is Shara Purusha? Shara Purusha is the manifest world in the waking state. What is Akshara Purusha? Akshara Purusha is the same manifest world, goes into a potential condition, into the causal form, into the seed form, in the sleep state. That is called as Akshara Purusha. Akshara means imperishable. Why it is imperishable? Because again, it comes back in the morning. These are the two natures of Bhagavan, Shara Akshara. Then the Lord gives us a bombshell. He said, now, oh student, you have understood my nature. Yeah, yeah, the student says, yeah, I have understood. Your Shara Purusha, Akshara Purusha is so easy. Waking state is Shara, Akshara Purusha is sleep state. 
That's it. I have understood. No, the Lord says no. There is another higher nature, which is beyond the shara and the akshara, which is beyond the manifest and the unmanifest. That is called as the original nature. It is neither cause, it is neither effect. It is neither sat, it is neither asat. You can never say it is existent, it, you can never say it is non-existent. It is beyond both existence and non-existence. It is called as the nirguna avastha. There is no gunas in that, there is no objects in that, there are no differences in the world. There are no differences at all. It is the param, Paramartha Sarupa. It is the highest absolute nature, which is called as Uttama Purusha, which is called as Purushottama. It is in this it is the source of the entire universe, including my body and mind. Every day I see this, every day I experience this, but nobody has taught me this. That I have an existence beyond this body and mind. And that is what is called as pure existence, which is called as satyam. It can never be destroyed. It always exists. It existed in the past. It existed now. It will exist in the night. When I go to sleep, it will always be existent, existent, existent. You can never deny ex your own existence at any point of time because that is satya. And what is this manifest, unmanifest? That is an appearance. Appearance means mithya. Like a TV show, it comes and goes in the screen of the TV. The screen is this Uttama Purusha. What comes and goes is Shara Purusha, Akshara Purusha. From the 19th to 20th verse, the Lord says, if you know my nature as Uttama Purusha, you have fulfilled all the goals of your life. Initially, you thought dharma was your goal. Following dharma, you gained artha and kama. Artha means wealth, kama means entertainment. In life, you earn money, you enjoyed yourself, you followed dharma. Very good. You came to know what is Shara Purusha and what is Akshara Purusha. What is waking state? What is the sleep state? But you never knew there is a higher nature beyond the sleep state, which is your real nature. That is Purushottama. That is the highest in this world. There is nothing beyond Purushottama, nothing beyond this pure, formless, nirguna avastha. This is the Turiyam of Mandukya Upanishad. Having known this as my real nature, I can live my whole life as the pure consciousness, as the pure self, and learn to face the life of this body and mind as an appearance. It comes and goes. I face the problems of life. Whatever joy it gives me, okay, fine. Whatever sorrow it gives me, it is also acceptable because I accept the nature of karma. The body is born because of prarabdha karma to fructify the fruits of the previous actions of my previous body. I, this body was given to me by Ishvara. This body follows the law of creation. The law of creation is basically 
to give the fruit of previous karmas. And then when the karmas are exhausted, you leave the body you, you, and then you take another body. That is the law of karma. But with the help of the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita or of any other scriptures, Ek Omkar, that is another beautiful scripture. Ek Omkar is nothing else but the same Turiyam Atma. It is the same principle which is, which is revealed in the Bhagavad Gita. Ek Omkar is the same pure consciousness awareness. If I know this pure nature of mine, I have fulfilled my life's goals. All of us know there are four goals in life. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Moksha is the last. How can I know my real nature is not the body or mind, but it is this pure awareness. So the crux of this whole chapter, learn by heart three verses of this chapter, 16, 17, 18. Throughout your life, chant this, remember this, remember the meaning, what I have just now described to you. If you have not understood, you can again ask me or go through the commentary of any Acharya. Swami Chinmayananda's books are available. Ashavidya, Dayanand Saraswati's books are available. Sarvapriyananda's books are available. So many things are available in the net. Now, the, everything is available in the, in the website. In, in my own website, there are five versions of the Bhagavad Gita mentioned in uh, www.vedantastudents.com, you'll find five, four or five versions of Bhagavad Gita. If you want to learn Bhagavad Gita in a very short form, verse by verse form, very short, briefly, there is one version available. If you want to, the best version to follow, if you want to go verse by verse, if you want to learn the entire Bhagavad Gita is, there is a section in, my, in the Vedanta students, it's called as Master Gita, Master Life. I have the full 18 chapters verse by verse in that section of the website. If you want to go at any verse, it's available there. So basically all the study which we do is only to realize something about myself. You must remember this very, very clearly. I want to know who am I? And what is my real nature? Knowing which I don't need to know anything else in life. This is knowledge. In the higher texts like Upanishads and Brahma Sutra and Bhashyams, it's the same knowledge, but you try to refine that knowledge further and further. Brahma Sutra is like a PhD. You refine your own mind. It's a refining of your own tuning of the mind. Go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper till you realize I am that ultimate. It is all in me. I have to realize it in me, nowhere else. That is the beauty of these scriptures. With this introduction to chapter 15, I will now go to the uh, text proper. I will try to give you a gist of how we need to study this chapter from where is this chapter coming from and then we'll go into the verses probably next week we will get into the actual verses but today let me finish this uh, portion purushottha yoga is basically it is a shastra now I, shastra means what shastra means it's a complete text all the important topics which are there are discussed in a Shastra about Jiva, about Jagat, about Ishvara. How do I see all three in one? That is what is this 15th chapter. And why do we say this particular chapter is the Shastram of the Gita? Because in the last verse, in the 20th verse, the Lord himself says, say, says Iti Guhyatamam Shastram 
I have taught the most secret science. Shastram. Shastram means it's a science. The science of the self. The science of knowing I am the pure consciousness. It is a science. It is not, it is a, it's a pure science. Like you do atomic physics or nuclear physics or you do biology or something. Here, what you do is you go through the in-depth version of your own nature. And you, you, you go into your own personality and then you dissect your personality in such a way that you reach the core. That is called a Shastra. And Guhya Tamam, Guhya Tamam means it is the highest secret. And knowing this, what happens? I will fulfill all the duties in life. There's nothing else to do in life. Just remain as pure Atma. Life will go on on its own. Prakarana Ganthas are topical. There are certain texts which deal with only Jiva with only Ishwara, or only Jagat, or only Aikyam. Or they are just dealing with the preliminary methodologies. But Shastra means it is a complete science. How do we enter this? How is the connection of the 15th chapter and the 14th chapter? There are two, three verses which are important. I've just put them together. Amamcha yogi vichare na bhakti yogi one sevate saguna samite te itan brahma buyaya kalpate. Here in the 14th chapter, the 26th and the 27th verses are very important. They lead you to the 15th chapter. So in the, in the 26th verse, Lord Krishna in the 14th chapter says to go beyond the gunas to go beyond the prakriti, to go beyond your own mind and body, what you have to do is, you have to have complete devotion, unswerving, unswerving devotion towards me, the higher principle, which is the formless, which is the purushottama. You need to keep your mind focused on that aspect of the formless nature of the Lord. Brahmanohi pratishtaham amrutasya vevasicha shashvatasya chadharmasya sukasaikante kasicha. What it says is, I am the immortal, immutable bliss. I am the timeless principle. Whatever we have in this world which we experience is in time. I see the body in time. I am born in time. This body will go in time. But I am timeless. This is what I should know. I have a, another nature of mine which is called as Sakshi, which is called as Purusha Uttama. I am that pure consciousness. If I know I am that pure consciousness, I am timeless. I am immutable, not changeable. It is always there. The body changes, mind changes because it is affected by time. How do I know what is timeless? Every day I experience this. In sleep, I am not, I, there is no time. There is no space. There is no body. There is no universe. There is no, uh, there is no, uh, there, there is no father, mother. All these are in potential condition as a seed form. And who is seeing that? Who is seeing that potential condition? That potential condition is nature. It is prakriti. I am not Prakriti, I am Purusha. I am the consciousness. That consciousness which is seeing, which is the substratum, 
which is revealing this nature of na nature of manifestation and unmanifestation that seer that consciousness principle is changeless it has never changed something which has never changed that is what is the definition of the truth trikala abaditam that means past also it was there before the body is born i am consciousness while the body is there in the manifest form i am conscious of the body when the body is sleeping i am conscious that the mind has gone to sleep condition and i experience nothing that nothing is blankness that blankness is called as ignorance mula avidya it is the sakshi which is the witness of the un which is the sakshi which is a witness of the seed condition of the entire universe not only this body not only this mind entire universe this is how i have to realize my true nature i am the imperishable amrut amrutam abode of supreme knowledge this knowledge about the formless nature of mind is called as supreme knowledge it is the highest knowledge available because this is a liberating knowledge it liberates me from my identification with the body and the mind as me in the waking state we put on the dress no problem we go through the vyavahara no problem but remember this vyavaharika state is not my real state i am without the coat of body and mind as the pure self which is purushottama this verse is a sutra that means the 27th verse of the 14th chapter is the is the basis on which lord krishna starts the 15th chapter he elaborates on the nature of brahman or this pure consciousness and what is this nature how do we understand this through a sutra sutra means what sutra means it has got this definition alpaksharam asandigdam sarasvat vishvato mukham a sutra should be precise it should not cause any doubt and it is something which is presenting the essence of many thoughts without any defects that is what is called as a sutra so the 27th verse he is talking about the immortal immutable nature absolute bliss of that one entity three words shashvatam sukham amritam timeless immortal and everlasting ananda that is the nature of this awareness so this four letters which is described in the 27th verse is the subject matter of the whole 20 verses of the 15th chapter next week we will start from verse number 1 shri bhagavan uvacha i will just chant this and then we will follow it up next week urdhva moolam madashakham ashvatham prahuravyam chandamsi yasya parnani yastam vedasa vedavit the lord starts this chapter on his own there is no question from arjuna 
because the Lord wants to explain to Arjuna the nature of samsara. And he says the nature of samsara can be understood when you take the example of Ashwatha tree, the people tree or the banyan tree, which has got heart-shaped leaves. He will give us the beautiful descriptions or the comparison between the tree and the samsara. Samsara means our life. How do I see the life of a tree and the life of a jiva? That is the subject which we will, that is in the introduction verses. We will continue this next week. And today, if you have any questions, I'll be free to answer them. So the 20th, the 20 verses can be learned by heart. If you, I am every time before the class, I am playing this soundtrack of Swami Brahmananda from uh, Chinna Mission. You, if you like to have this, I can send the audio of this to you uh, so that you can also practice and learn. Uh, and uh, if you, even if, even if you can't chant the 20 verses, there is one verse. Aham Vaishwanaro Bhutva, if you know that verse, and if you can chant that verse before your meals, that will help you to remember the Lord. And uh, it's a very beautiful chapter. It will help you uh, to, to understand the Lord. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, it is, it's got some very beautiful techniques. You see, ultimately, it's all techniques. And uh, you, will, you will understand how to apply those techniques in, in yourself and uh, learn to see this uh, Lord in your own body. The 14th verse is what is this Aham Vaishwanaro Bhutva. So learn the 14th verse and chant it every time before you eat your food so that you remember the Lord who is present in the form of the digestive fire. This brings a connection between me and the higher principle, which is the Purushottama in this body. That is why they say chant one verse. And believe me, if you keep chanting this, you will, not, you will never miss the connection with the Lord at least during, while eating food. And every day we eat. So once during, whenever you have your main meal of the day, chant this. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachade Purnasya Purnamadhaya Purnameva Vasishade Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om So if you have any questions, you can put on the chat box or you can ask yourself. Uh, okay, the first one is, uh, please do send me the link to go through these verse uh, chapters again. Sri Krishna, who is this? Uh, can you send me a mail uh, or you speak? Uh, can you send me a mail, uh, WhatsApp or a mail so that I can uh, give me your email address? Uh, I can send the link to you. Uh, the link will have all. See anybody, if you, uh, anyone, if you want to have, you can get the link of all the 150 talks I have so far given. Uh, so please let me know who you are so that we can send it to you. Uh, that's number one. What comes sir? It is Ramesh Raghun here. Yeah, Ramesh, you wanted the link? I wanted the link, sir. Okay, no problem. I'll send it to you. Just uh, send me your, uh, you have my email address? I do, sir. I do. Okay, just send me your email address. I will send the, uh, the, the link of all the 150 sessions. Right, sir. 
And, uh, and sir, you also mentioned that about that verse by verse, that Gita, Mastering Gita. Yeah, Master Gita, Master Life, that is also available in the website. If you want, I can put that also in the link and send Please you. Please do, sir, because I was looking at the website. I couldn't find that master. No, okay, uh, so I will send you the link. Yes, sir. Which has got the, uh, all the videos and the notes of all the talks. Achha. At the same time, I'll also add in that one additional link of the... Um, of the Master Gita, Master Life. Right, sir. So that will give you every verse explanation of the whole Gita. Lovely, sir. And okay. uh, today's recap was just amazing. I think it was you know, so much more simple and clarified. Nandri. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, what is website? Bina. Uh, uh, the website address is www.vedantastudents.com. And Bina, if you can send me your mail also, I can send you the links uh, so that it's easy for you. Uh, if you can just send me an email. Uh, I put the uh, address here, vedatastudents.com. You can, you can see that. So this is the website. So if you need, uh, please give me email ID. Uh, that you can write to this uh, vedatastudents.com. You know, we will reply to you. So, uh, or shaker at uh, singnet.com.sg, you know, or uh, if you go through my WhatsApp, uh, you, if you're in the WhatsApp group, you can see, you can see the uh, uh, phone number there. You can write to me. I can send you the link also. Okay. Anybody else has any other questions or any comments on the, on the Gita introduction, which I gave this uh, today in the first 45 minutes? Uh, do you have any questions or any clarifications? Uh, because today was a, it's a, it was a good introduction to people who, who are joining also newly. Uh, yeah, yeah Sidhan Singh, do you have any questions? You can unmute yourself and then ask if you have, or anybody else, if you have any, uh, Sidhan, do you have any questions? No, sir, not right now, but I also need the notes. So I will send you the, uh, the uh, email. And yeah, the, please send me the email. I can just forward the notes to you. No problem. Sure, Sharan. Thank you so much. Okay. Is there any? <laughs> yeah. Is there any other uh, person who wants you have any other question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bolia, uh, uh, as you were saying, uh, we compare a tree to us. What do you mean by that? Huh? Yeah, the tree is basically uh, uh, it's a comparison of a tree with the entire life. You see, in this 15th chapter, the Lord tries to compare Ashwatha tree. Mm -hmm. And then he says, your life you can compare with the tree. We will see the details of that in our next session. And uh, you can you can know what this uh, uh, you know yeah, as we study this you will know in the next in the next uh, uh, talk I'll be talking about this tree because I think um, most of the trees live more than the human isn't it you see some are trees hundred and fifty years yes that's correct you see the Ashwatha tree is the oldest you see if you see that can that can live live for hundreds of years. Hmm. That is why Lord Krishna has picked up the Ashwatha tree and he says that if you look at the tree and study the tree and then compare your life with the tree, you will find, he will say that the roots are above and the leaves are below and he will, the Lord will give us a picture of how to see our own life and realize the highest form of truth in us. Yeah. So, uh, just wait for two, the next talk. You will find uh, more details in the next talk. Mm, because the Ashwatha tree is uh, upside down, right? You see the roots are yes. up, the thing is down. That's correct. But, but in uh, in the earth, the roots are on inside the earth. Ah, okay, okay. Right. See here, you should not take the uh, you should not take the literal meaning of uh, the roots being upside down. What it means is that the root of the life mm -hmm. is beyond what we see as the body and mind. Mm -hmm. That is what you should understand. Mm -hmm. 
it, you don't say that it is uh, it is up here it does not mean it is up what it means is the root is beyond the level of what my sense organs can perceive like i said in the beginning of this talk the formless nature of the universe the formless nature of lord we can know only as something beyond this world so here when we say the root is above what it means is it's beyond the sense organs <laughs> it doesn't mean physically the roots are above and the and the and the and the and the, and the roots is it is it is it is a language of the uh, uh, bhagavad gita by which by by way of these paradoxes the lord wants to wake you up you know he just says hey, so that uh, the literal meaning is not above it means it's above it is beyond the sense organs so it's clear so how we can write about the three guna ha ah, that you have to study the 14th chapter you see the 14th chapter clearly says mm. the way to rise beyond the three gunas is to tell yourself i am the pure consciousness yes, yes, yes. Mm. tell I'm yourself yes you see you have to tell yourself deliberately i am the pure awareness mm -hmm. i am not the body and mind and yes right. that's correct you see this is what is called as brahma vidya mm. so this is where you have to say this is the essence of the whole gita Mm. it teaches me that how do i see myself as this pure awareness mm. which is what we are you see this is our nature mm. okay anybody else has a question uh, how do we explain this trilogy uh, life after death ah oh, that's a very great question <laughs> life after death uh. most of them are, uh, most of us are anxious to know what happened to our uh, life after death then yeah you see what happens to life after death is exactly what okay if i ask you i'll ask you another question mm -hmm. what is what how do you how do you uh, what happens to you during your sleep sometimes i get dream this all okay in in after death you will not get any dreams mm -hmm. so yeah. what is what is your state of what what is your state when you are sleeping you yeah. have no body no. you are not aware of the body you are not aware of the world you are not aware aware of anything in life and consciousness the yes that is what is your nature that is what you are before you come into this world to experience this world and then that is what you are when you leave this world so nothing happens to you uh, after death you just go back to your own nature and consciousness yes i am the pure consciousness which is immortal and that is what lord krishna is teaching us in the 15th chapter 16 17 18 three verses learn by heart if you know just go through my text you will find that if you understand these three verses of the bhagavad gita you will know what you are after death 15 16 17 right yeah 16 17 18 these are the three verses it talks about the nature of the lord in the perishable form imperishable form in the original form that is what i described in the beginning i said what is perishable is called as shara purusha mm -hmm. that means my nature is also perishable mm -hmm. then imperishable nature there is a nature of the lord which is imperishable which is also my nature which is imperishable what mm -hmm. is that nature it is the nature which is called as the seed state the seed state is the sleep state the sleep state is where everything is in a seed form again it will project again the seed will uh, fructify into another body but this is not my real form 
this is only as incidental appearance like i see in the movie right in the tv screen mm -hmm. or i see a real movie in the screen in the screen i see that so these are all appearances mm -hmm. so both this perishable and the imperishable both these forms are not my real forms that means my waking state and my sleep state both are not my real forms mm -hmm. And what is my real form? The real form is something which lies beyond that, which is called as Purushottama, Uttama Purusha. In the 18th verse, he says, I am that Uttama Purusha. The Lord is telling us in this 18th chapter, in this 15th chapter. And he's telling us for what? To tell you, to tell us that your nature is also the same because you and I are ultimately the pure consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Anybody else has a question? This one, the secretary, or this one is WW Vedanta student. Isn't yeah, it? that is the that is the website in which you will find all the web, uh, notes of all the prastana trayam. Oh. That means for the Upanishads, you will find the notes there. For the 500 Brahma Sutras, also you will find the notes there. Mm -hmm. And for the entire Bhagavad Gita, you will find the notes there. Mm -hmm. So 16, 17, 18, somebody is asking, Ramesh, you are asking, it is from the chapter 15th of the Bhagavad Gita. So that which is right. uh, uh, which is what the, the, the Lord says, I am neither the Akshara Purusha, neither the Akshara Purusha, or I am the, but I am the Uttama Purusha. Uttama Purusha. Purusha. Uttama Purusha is the Purusha Uttama. Got it. Got it. Okay. So this is the one which I have to keep it in mind throughout my life. Mm -hmm. And this is the Lord's, you see, once when, when my mind travels in this direction, what happens is that slowly that mind also becomes formless. Mm -hmm. You see, this is the trick of Bhagwan. He gives his form and he tells you, you meditate on me like this. When you start meditating, you will find that my own form becomes his form. Okay. Any other yes. questions? So last question, sir. You, yeah. men you mentioned that one should chant this verse before having food or something. I missed that. Yeah, that, that is the 14th verse. That uh, is of chapter? Of the chapter 15, there is, okay. a, there is a verse number 14, and that verse number 14 goes like this, yeah? Aham vaishvanaro bhutva praninam dehamashitaha pranapana samayuktaha pachanam chaturvidam. So here what the Lord says is, I become the fire, the digestive fire, in all the human beings. And it is associated with the, with the prana and apana. That means this digestion, if it is not good in your body, your body cannot survive. Neither the prana will go on because your, your food cannot be digested. Therefore, your body will decay. So chanting this sloka, helps us, anybody can chant this, your whole family can chant this one verse. Learn it by heart. In all the schools of Chinma Mission or the Arshavidya schools, where Swamiji's are trained, they ask you to chant the full chapter, not only this 14th verse, so that you learn this by heart, the full chapter. But for us who are all, you know, in this Grahastha Ashrama, what we can do is just to chant one verse. So that you can get connected to that pure awareness in yourself. Many of us in our meditations, we will, we will be able to know this pure awareness. But we don't know that that is our real nature. That is the problem. That is called as ignorance. That ignorance goes away when I learn the Bhagavad Gita. I am that pure consciousness that message is given to us in the 15th chapter and the 14th and the 13th chapter. These three chapters are the 
most important chapters. If you want to know who you are, I am that pure consciousness you want to learn, learn that in the 14th chapter by dropping all the gunas of the mind. Learn that in the 15th chapter by, by seeing the perishable and the imperishable nature of the Lord, that means of the manifest condition in the waking state, unmanifest condition in the sleep state, drop this. And then ask the question, what is the nature of the Lord and what is my nature? And you will have only one answer. The nature of the Lord and the nature of mine is only one, which is pure awareness. Mm -hmm. And this is what is called as liberation. This is called as moksha. Mm -hmm. Understanding this pure consciousness as our real nature gives me the freedom to drop the identification with the body and mind and say, I am one with that higher principle. At whatever age we are, we learn this Bhagavad Gita and we can be free from the cycle of birth and death. That is how this uh, beautiful chapter of 15th chapter called Purushottama Yoga. Okay, so with that, we will close today and then we'll continue next week. Thank you and good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.